Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the session, especially on a Friday afternoon after this amazing KubeCon. I hope you had a good time. I certainly did. I'm Michael, working for VMware, and today's session is about Kubernetes resource management, mainly from like the mechanics behind Kubernetes resource management, as well as some of the lessons learned and best practices that I uh, learned from working with customers uh, in the field. Before we kick off, I just wanted to get a feeling of, of the audience. Uh, developers in the room, please raise your hands. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's almost 50%, good. Um, operators, SREs, um, architects, this group of people. It's a little bit more, okay, nice. Um, good, so who, who has heard about Kubernetes resource management, um, the primitives, just who's familiar with this topic? That's, that's less people, okay. Uh, who's using it in production? That's, that's more people, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And who thinks, who thinks it's easy to use and easy to get right? Some hands there? Okay, I, I don't think it's easy to use, so um, I'm glad you are here in the session. Two years ago, Tim Hawken um, gave a great presentation on resource management, the kind of the reason why you would want to do resource management in your cluster, but also the complexities associated with, with this topic, mainly from his experience of running um, a Borg or, or working with Borg, but also the primitives that Kubernetes give us when it comes to resource management, and also the gaps between Kubernetes and Borg, where Kubernetes was falling short by that time. And I thought I'd stand on the, on the shoulders of this um, giant or giants and build on his presentation and see how far we've come since then and uh, what we've learned as well as the best practice that um, I typically use in the field with customers. But also keep in mind that this topic and what we're going to cover here in the 30 minutes is just a small um, thing in, in a bit much bigger picture of resource management. Mainly what we can cover here is capacity planning, um, tooling processes, change management, which all play into this, this huge topic of resource management. So the agenda is, or will be like a short introduction, then we'll cover Kubernetes primitives as well as how they are implemented, and then at the end of the presentation we'll have best practices and hopefully time for Q&A. So this is the, and I'm sorry if it's not readable in the back, but I just wanted to show you, this is the Kubernetes Nginx ingress spec, deployment spec, and if the, since this is a talk on quality of service and resource management, can someone spot what's missing in this um, p uh, deployment file? Just shout it out loud if you want. Great, thank you very much. There's something missing in here. So what, if you deploy the uh, Nginx controller with this kind of um, manifest, what, what could happen? If you send it to the API server during admission, this deployment or part at the end of the day could be rejected because there might be the resource quota admission controller um, be activated. It could be modified by the limit ranger, another admission plugin in the API server. Both of them we'll cover later. If it made it through um, and it's running, this pod might not get enough resources because it didn't ask for any resources, so it might be starved. Uh, it could affect other pods running on the same kubelet, so it become a nice, noisy neighbor, for example, if it's bursty. It could be evicted by the, kube, uh, evicted by the kubelet when the kubelet comes under pressure or it could be killed um, by the Linux kernel as a last line of defense. So basically, this pod won't give you um, any kind of predictable runtime behavior, but depending on the workload that you want to run, so not necessarily the Nginx, but maybe the batch jobs, that might be fine. So you might ask, like, well, I'm running Kubernetes in production, everything is fine, so what? Who cares? So I found these user stories um, pretty interesting, and if the guys from Monzo and Zalando are in the, uh, here in the audience, a big shout out to these guys, because I learned a lot from those um, issues that they posted and their, some of the postmortems or outages that they reported, and they were pretty interesting and lessons learned from there, not necessarily by not applying Kubernetes resource management primitives, but by, for example, by some defaults that are in the like, implementation detail which just didn't work for, for, these, uh, for these people. All the links, by the way, uh, are in the appendix of this presentation. It's already online, so um, just 
have a look at the appendix. So some operating system basics first before we def, um, uh, dig into Kubernetes. If you run a container, say you docker run hello, the client, the docker client sends a create a command to the docker engine. Um, this happens in user space. And after some initialization in the docker engine, eventually a syscall exec will be called for the entry point or command specified in the, in the, in the docker file. What happens then is we switch into kernel mode, and I left out some, some of the details here, but we switch into kernel mode. And now the kernel takes over and creates a task struct for this um, command and binary that, that we want to run. So basically, the kernel doesn't really know or has this notion of thread and processes. What he builds in memory is a task struct, which has some properties, and I just sketched out some here, which is C groups and namespaces. Some of you, you have, might have heard already. And then it needs to find a resource to run our uh, uh, container or our binary. So it kicks in the scheduler. The scheduler kicks in of the Linux um, uh, kernel. It finds a CPU, hopefully. And uh, if it found the CPU, it kind of schedules the process or the, the task struct on the CPU. And eventually, it will go running and print Hello World. So Linux kernel is just concerned mainly around uh, task struct here, because I get a lot of question of, OK, this is a process and this is a thread, so wh what are we dealing with? Basically, we're dealing with task structs. And also, we are not dealing with containers in the sense of the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel, as of now, doesn't really have a notion of a container. It's just a set of properties in the task struct. So if that might sound easy, right? Now, as a concrete example, imagine we have one CPU and we want to run two containers, which are pretty CPU bound, so both want to keep, keep the CPU busy. What the Linux kernel in the uh, default scheduling algorithm, which is the completely fair scheduler, tries to do is it just wants to be fair to all the task structs it, it, it's uh, asked to run. So it puts in a weight, a share, so to say, which you can find here. And by default, that's 1024. And if the shares are equal, that's basically a sign for the kernel to um, give both the same amount of CPU time. Now, that's easy if just our containers want to run each a task struct or just constru uh, uh, constructed of this one task struct. But what if our container A is a little bit smarter and spins more threads in, in user uh, lingo, basically meaning that you, it creates more task structs. Now, the Linux kernel, if we don't have a grouping me mechanism, it tries to be fair to all the task structs. And now certainly we, don't, uh, we are not really fair between the two processes because container E with the uh, more task structs gets more CPU time at the end of the day. So 10 years ago, Google contributed C groups uh, to the Linux kernel. And basically what that means, it kind of implemented a grouping mechanism around these task structs that now at a group level, you can define your weights or shares uh, that specify the, the amount of CPU time those um, uh, groups uh, uh, get, and we kind of back into fairness. C groups also can be used for accounting and other types of resource management. So it's not always a mechanism to um, or needed for resource management. You can also just use it for some statistics and um, apply some um, statistics coverages there. But mainly we use C groups for uh, CPU and memory and I/O control where you can specify priorities or uh, limits on certain resources, for example, also on PIDs, and you can do accounting. So it's a pretty um, um, sophisticated thing that we have in a Linux kernel scheduler to work uh, with resources. Usually it's mounted in the ZFS, so the hierarchy and the interface that we can interact from userland is mounted in the ZFS. And there's two versions that exist in the Linux kernel. Version 2 has just been finalized in one of the uh, recent uh, Linux kernel versions. As far as I know, most of the container runtimes uh, still use uh, version 1 of uh, this C group interface. Now, if you want to run a container, just to switch more into kernel world now, you've got these flags like dash dash CPU and dash memory. For example, here we want to run BusyBox and execute top in BusyBox. And we say, just give me one CPU and 200 megabytes of memory. What ends up happening is that top in the BusyBox container still sees all of our CPU, which are in the node, and it sees 1.8 gigabytes of memory instead of the memory that we specified. So first thing to note here is that C groups are not namespaced, so the container sees kind of the, all the resources on the host and not from, a, from its container isolation perspective. 
And second thing to note here is, and uh, I'm going to read it for, for those people in the back, is since the container is kind of grouped in this um, C group hierarchy, which is this FS C group CPU Docker in this case, it gets some properties that tell the Linux kernel how to regulate resources on, on this container. And in this case, it gets a CPU share of 1024, that's the default value, but it gets some limits applied, mainly uh, a CFS period and quota, which are some kernel internals that mean that every 100 millisecond, evaluate the quota of this um, container, and if it's um, beyond this quota, just take it off and, um, and don't give it more time. Now, coming from a VM-centric world where we run one app per VM, we had these reservations typically that we have in the VM, like give me four CPUs and four gigabytes of memory. Here in this case, it's kind of the inverse. We specify some hard limits, some hard caps on, the, on our process, on our container, which you might get, but imagine you have just one CPU and ru you run 10 of these containers, the dash dash one CPU doesn't give you one CPU. It means basically you at best time, you maximum get one CPU, but you could get less, because if you have more processes running, everyone gets a fair share. Also for memory, here, it will specify a limit, so it's not a guarantee, it's actually a limit that's been applied with the dash flag. And so this is some of the misunderstandings that I typically see in the field when people start with containers, that they come from this VM reservation model, now they are into the kernel model, use those flags, but actually the flags are kind of the inverse what they expect. Also keep in mind that we don't specify gigahertz or um, anything else here. We, what, we, what we do specify is a kind of a time, a quota, a period, which could vary between your infrastructure. Say, for example, you run this container on your local machine with this flag. It could be a 1.8 gigahertz machine. Or on the cloud, it could be 1. whatever machine. So it's not really a, a, a megahertz or gigahertz that you specify here. And the hard limit, that's what we already covered. Just to recap uh, this introduction here, from the Linux kernel point of view, containers are just normal processes or task structs to be precise here. The Linux kernel default algorithm is completely fair, so the more task structs are running, it tries to be fair uh, beyond them or amongst them, and you can influence this behavior by tuning those shares. Containers use cgroups and namespaces for um, prioritization and isolation on the host, but for example, for cgroups, there's not always isolation, as we've seen with the BusyBox. Another biggest question is, okay, I got this for containers on, on my machine, but how do we do that at cluster scale? And this is where Kubernetes quality of service comes, comes into game. I made this uh, slide for 1.10, I just changed them for 1.10, and I hope I have covered everything and the reason changes there. So in Kubernetes, in a Kubernetes cluster, typically what we want to achieve is a certain level of isolation between tenants or different namespaces or teams. We want to have prioritization. We want to apply some quota so that some team cannot use more than, for example, eight CPUs. We want to be fair between them, but also we want to increase efficiency in the cluster that, for example, if one team is not using uh, its resources, the other one can make use of the idle resources. So there's a lot of things that we want to achieve in a Kubernetes cluster, and those, those are things that might not always work together. Nice also keep in mind, all the primitives that, primitives that we're going to cover next are just at the cluster binary. So if you have multiple clusters, you have to think about how to make this kind of resource management work across cl cluster boundaries. And if you run in a cloud or on a hypervisor, typically that's what the underlying infrastructure does for you. If you run on bare metal, you have to be aware of kind of not creating silos by running multiple clusters, because there's not yet this kind of global resource sharing between clusters. So the next slides will cover kind of the quality of service life cycle, the different stages that uh, your application travels um, in during its life cycle. First, of course, the pod specification where we can specify uh, our requests, our resource requests, or guarantees that we expect from, from Kubernetes. Then we go into the Kubernetes master, which does admission and, and scheduling. We'll cover that. And in the end, we're going to look at the node where actually the enforcement happens when your container or process runs uh, on, on the kubelet. On the right-hand side, you can always see kind of in which phase we are currently. In Kubernetes, there are stable resources for um, specifying resource requirements, and those are CPU and memory. We've also got some beta resources, which is huge, huge pages, ephemeral storage, and device plugins. And yesterday, there was a great talk by Louise from Intel, and she covered a lot of the very details and performance tuning aspects of some advanced te techniques like NUMA scaling, uh, NUMA tuning, huge pages, etc. It was a great talk. 
We also have some custom resources. For example, you want to have some, some very specific company specific resources that only you, you have. Those are extended resources that you can use in a cluster, uh, for example, for licenses or, or dongles. So you can, can extend uh, on the resource um, uh, properties. For each resource in Kubernetes in the spec, we have requests and limits. I usually say requests are kind of guarantees I'm going to expect from, from Kubernetes, and the limits are the hard cap that uh, my process should not um, get over or cross over. Those are specified at the container level, so they are not specified at the pod level, but at the container level. And currently, only CPU, memory, and ephemeral storage allow for overcommitment, meaning that you can specify different requests and limits. You can send, set them the same, which you have to, for example, for GPUs, which doesn't allow for overcommit. But you also can say, I just want one CPU as a request for my pod, and maybe four CPUs as a limit, so you can, uh, can burst in between them. Those fields are read-only, so if you want to change them, you have to recreate the pod or the deployment. So this controls, for example, all the things that you just didn't found here in the spec, CPU memory, um, things that you didn't found can be maybe set by syscontrol. So this link has a, link, uh, a list of all the things that you can set from a syscontrol perspective, uh, either per container or on, on the host. And then there's always the question, like, how can I set bandwidth guarantees or thresholds or limits, for example, for disk and network? And that turned out to be not so easy. And there's also discussion on whether this will eventually this will ever make it into Kubernetes. So this link has um, a design guide, a discussion on why this is currently not implemented as a resource. Here, just as an example, we have an Nginx pod that does specify resource uh, limits in this case. Keep in mind, if you only specify limits, Kubernetes um, sets request equals limits, so you, that's just a shortcut and not, so you don't have to specify requests. In this case, our container will get well, we ask for two CPUs and 200 megabytes of memory, meaning as a request, but also as a, as a limit in this, uh, in this specification. Okay, we got our uh, specification. We have our pod um, YAML file. Now we're going to submit it to the API server. Um, the API server has different admission controllers that you might be aware of. And two admission controllers that we are concerned here are the um, resource quota admission controller and the, the limit range, which we cover later. Resource quota admission controller allows you, as a cluster uh, operator, to set a certain quota on a namespace, so it's a namespace resource right now, that you can say this team, this namespace should never ever get more than eight CPUs or 20 pods or whatever, but you can also set some requests as a uh, upper bound, under boundary. Then if if you don't want to enforce your users to specify requests and limits, or if you don't trust them, you as a cluster operator can set some defaults or enforce some, some limits uh, and requests with the limit ranger in the API server. Keep in mind, when you do those sizing and calculations or specifications as a cluster operator, keep in mind that there's currently no namespace resource sharing. That, for example, if you set a namespace on 8 CPU and the other one on 4 CPU, but the 4 CPU namespace is kind of on its limit and the other one is idle, it cannot currently make use of the idle resources in another namespace. And there's a community project I'm going to mention later which tries to resolve this. So be, be aware of how to size the quota uh, on, on the namespaces. Now we go into the scheduling phase. The scheduler looks at all the nodes in your cluster and kind of builds a node info cache in memory. So it, has, it knows about each node in, in, um, in its memory. But it looks only at the capacity, like what does this node have? For example, if you have a VM with four CPUs, it looks at those properties and not actual usage. But also keep in mind that the scheduler does not use the node capacity, those four CPUs, for example, but it uses something called allocatable. What is allocatable? Allocatable is the, at the end of the day, the sum or the rest of everything that the node has minus some reservations that you can apply, minus some eviction thresholds, which we'll cover later. So allocatable typically is lower than the whole node capacity. And this causes some confusion for some customers, like I do have capacity in my cluster, but the scheduler is not scheduling it. It's just because the scheduler uses allocatable and not the full uh, node capacity. During scheduling, the scheduler has some predicates and, and priority ranking. We don't have time to look into the scheduling algorithm. There was a talk yesterday in SIG scheduling which covered this in detail. But what a scheduler does, it looks at the resource requests 
of the incoming pod doesn't con is not concerned about limits right now. It just looks at the requests coming in, and then it looks at the, no the allocatable resources that are tracks in memory for each node, and it starts well scheduling. It would never overcommit a node based on the request. So if you have a pod with four CPUs coming in, but there's no allocatable left for four CPUs, it will not schedule it on there. That's admission, admission check. There's um, something that you have to keep in mind. Daemon sets currently do not use the Linux, uh, the Kubernetes scheduler to schedule, so they have the kind of their own scheduling me mechanism, which could lead to race conditions or some unintended behavior. Uh, there's a feature alpha and 1.10 which tries to fix it, and the goal is to make the daemon sets also being scheduled by the, Lin uh, by the Kubernetes scheduler. So now on the node, which is where the magic actually happens. We're on the kubelet now. C groups are used on the kubelet to enforce most of what we've covered so far around um, CPU and memory. I created this diagram because I found it very hard to figure out what CPU requests or memory requests and limits map to actually on, on the node. I think this is, there's some room in the documentation to improve this. So on the kind of the upper layer is your pod manifest, which specifies CPU requests and limits, also for memory. And internally they map on the node, on the kubelet, the kubelet maps those to CPU shares for requests and CPU quota and period for the limits. For the memory, it's a little bit different because the Linux kernel has no memory kind of um, request or uh, a guarantee in there because it's also a shared resource. So requests map to something called out of memory score adjust. We'll cover that later. And limits map to memory limits, actually. Now, one thing to uh, point out here is that if you run on a cloud provider or on a, on a hypervisor platform, also be in mind or take, in, take into account that your underlying hypervisor has to be aligned or has to actually provide those guarantees. For example, if you have a Linux OS with four CPUs, you also want to have the hypervisor provide the resources to this VM and not being overcommitted or, or contended, or at least be aware of this. For example, if you run burstable cloud instances that at some point of time your CPU will just be capped and this Linux kernel is just not aware of this because it happens under, under it, and so you could run into performance, performance issues. So here we run an Nginx container uh, with limits CPU 1 and memory 200 megabytes. And we just want to dive into how this looks, how the kubelet translates this into um, the actual, actual C groups. The kubelet does adjust CPU shares. In this case, actually it's 1024, but if you would have specified something else here, the kubelet does some adjustment on the CPU shares. And for the CFS period and quota, it also applies uh, the limits in this case. So again, here we, get, we are hard capped at one CPU. This pod won't ever get more than one CPU. For memory, this is also applied uh, as a upper binary, in this case 200 megabytes. So again, here we are applying um, capacity um, limits to, to our pod, and as a guarantee, soft guarantee, we just have to use shares in this case. Now, it, it can be a little bit complicated to work with these requests and limits and figure out which kind of pod has wo which resource guarantees or which one has a higher priority or a lower priority. So very early Q uh, quality of service classes were incorporated in, into Kubernetes that make it a little bit easier from an end user perspective to, to see which kind of resource guarantees or um, um, classes I, I get, but also for the uh, kubelet to decide which pod has a higher priority or not. Um, those classes are derived from CPU and memory resource specifications in the, in the pod spec. And uh, just to give you some examples, if you don't specify anything for requests uh, and limits for your container, you are a best effort pod, classified best effort. If you specified some, you are a burstable pod, and if you specify all request limits for CPU and memory for all containers in this pod, then you are considered to be a guaranteed uh, pod. Now, there's some tricky magic happening inside, which we'll cover in a, in a second. First of all, the kubelet builds a hierarchy uh, on, uh, locally on the node, which you can see here on the right, meaning that, for example, our guaranteed pods will be living directly in the root hierarchy of the cube pods. So the higher you're in the right hierarchy, you typically have a higher resource guarantee or um, resource yeah, guarantees from the kubelet. And then it builds a sub-hierarchy for best effort and burstable, which it continuously adjusts values in there. So the kubelet does a lot of more magic than I'm showing here. And I think on the next slide, there's also a link of how the kubelet does this magic under the cover. So now, 
for since we talked about re uh, resources of a part whose requests will never be overcommitted, what if you actually do overcommit? You specify requests and limits, and you actually roll out pods on, on a node uh, that has not so many resources that you specified in the limits. You have to be aware of that there's kind of two types of resources, compressible resources and uncompressible resources. A CPU is a compressible resource, meaning we can throttle it in case of there's contention. Uh, memory and storage, we cannot shrink it or compact it, um, so that's uncompressible, and we have to, have to find another way to make space in case of there's contention on, on the kubelet. So for CPU throttling, the, uh, the kind of the value that's taking in account here is CPU shares. The more shares you have and the CPU has to be throttled, the more time you are at, at the end getting through this, uh, even during uh, throttling. But for memory and storage, the kubelet has to evict, start evicting, make space on the, on the host, and there's eviction logic applied here. If the kubelet cannot evict fast enough, because there's a kind of, I think, 10, sec 10 second polling evolved in here currently, the Linux kernel will just kick in and out of memory kill as a last line of defense, which is kind of not um, kind of synced with um, the kubelet, so the Linux kernel could just kick in and, um, and do its job. Now, the eviction threshold can be specified. The kubelet has some flex that you can use for eviction threshold, so you actually have some control for the eviction, eviction behavior. And also the kubelet, when under pressure, will signal to the API server that it's under pressure. The scheduler will take this into account and not schedule, hopefully not schedule pods onto this node because that would make the situation even worse. Now, before Kubernetes 1.9, those QoS classes that we just learned, Burstable, Best Effort, and Guarantee, they had an effect on the eviction order when the kubelet had to make uh, decisions. Um, so it was that the quality of service best effort was likely to be evicted first and then burstable and guaranteed as a last line of defense. That was pretty, uh, pretty easy to, to understand. Now that changed in 1.9, where actually th there's the question the kubelet asks, which part has the highest usage above its request? Typically that would be um, possibly a best effort pod, but it could also be a burstable pod. So the QoS classes here kind of are not really involved anymore. Then it looks for pod priority. If, it, if you don't have pod priority enabled in your cluster, then you, it will just skip it. And then at the, as a last line, it just use, uh, usage minors request and the pods that remain are then ranked. So the eviction logic has changed slightly. Then so it could also mean that guaranteed pods will be evicted because, for example, you have a system daemon or system process on the node, which is kind of struggling, and you, then the kubelet will make space for uh, by, by killing even guaranteed pods. Now, keep in mind, daemon sets are also pods. The kubelet doesn't understand that this is a daemon set, for example, it just sees a pod. Make sure that for daemon sets you also apply um, at least some, some burstable or guaranteed resources, because otherwise you could end up in killing, be, being evicted your daemon set, which could be your uh, network plugin, for example. There's much more going on that we can cover here on the covers uh, um, during this 30 minutes, I mean. So uh, I made this slide just as a reference. Uh, it's, all, it's all in the deck, so that, that could be helpful for troubleshooting if there's uh, something that you have to look into. Also, the community has seen that the, some of the primitives that there are in Kubernetes for resource management might not be sufficient. So they created uh, projects or extensions, like, for example, the Kubernetes Arbitrator, which allows for namespace sharing. That's pretty interesting. The CPU manager which kind of flips from those shares, which are just weights, which are relative weights, into CPU pinning. So some of you might be familiar with CPU pinning. The CPU, CPU manager will allow for CPU pinning. Then you actually get a CPU if you ask for a CPU, a full CPU dedicated. Pod priority is something that I was really happy to see coming into the Kube scheduler, which allows for adding priority fields to your workloads, to your pods, saying this is system critical, and so you have an easy way to specify your kind of priority so that the, that will also be taken into account, for example, during eviction. And the vertical pod autoscaler is actually starting to look at the metrics, the use resource utilization in your cluster, and trying to find the right requests and limits so you don't have to always watch and specify them manually. Exciting projects. So some best practices from the field before we wrap up. If in doubt, if you don't use quality of service or those, uh, the, the primitives in Kubernetes yet, just start with, with guaranteed um, resource classes. Guaranteed won't allow for overcommitment, so you might up end up in having a bad cluster utilization if you don't get the values right, but it gives you a safety net to learn and, and, and tune the system. 
Also enable quotas and um, enforce defaults in a cluster. This sounds easy, but I've seen so many clusters not really enforcing quotas or uh, at least not enforcing right defaults, which ends up happening a bad uh, experience for, for the workloads. Also cr protect uh, critical system pods. We covered this for, for, for daemon sets. Um, also keep in mind that as long as the kubelet is under control of your workload, that's fine. But you also have, may have other jobs running on, on, your, on your nodes, which are outside of control of the kubelet. For example, a backup agent, a, a plugin that's not managed by kubelet. Also make sure that that for those processes in the Linux kernel, you have resources um, applied to, which can be uh, done with C, uh, C groups. And then if you specify um, quality of service um, um, guarantees or, or requests in your, in your pod manifest, make sure you also kind of have them early in the CICD pipeline, not just in production when you roll out, because this would help catching some wrong fields or entries that you have very early uh, during the stage. Also do some stress testing, benchmarking to find the right values, because if it ends up happening in production, that's actually bad. Um, Tim, in his presentation, spoke about the Borg autopilot, which is a very sophisticated and maybe one of the best engineering things I've ever s heard of, uh, which does this kind of adjustment and learning and packing the cluster, uh, increasing high, increasing utilization. Also, we covered this when we talked about the underlying infrastructure, hypervisors, burstable cloud instances, etc. Make sure the whole stack is aligned, not just the pod and the Kubernetes, but also the Linux operating system or Windows operating system and underlying infrastructure if you run on a hypervisor or in the cloud. Monitoring is a very important aspect. And not just for CPU and memory, but also the Linux kernel is a shared resource. Some of the primitives we do have in pod and the pod spec can be applied, but there are some things like open file descriptors, TCP connections, um, PIDs, other, other stuff that at least you should monitor because you cannot express them in the pod specification. So you at least have to monitor them in order to avoid that you run into issues there. Now, remember the BusyBox top example that we had where BusyBox was limited to one CPU, but it's all the CPUs. Right now, this is a big issue for most of the programming languages, like for example, the Java runtime, the Go runtime, .NET. Um, Java used to get better if York Shard from Mesosphere is in the room. He wrote a great blog post on this. I think it's even linked in there. So for example, for Java, you would tune the, tune the heap size, garbage collection threads. For Go, you would tune Go max prox based on the limits that you specify. I've seen uh, environments with um, Go max prox not being aligned to the limits in the pod spec, which could end up having bad performance or like Monzo experienced uh, long GC pauses. Um, also for .NET, there's a GC tuning uh, and other stuff that you applied. All the links in there have more details that I can cover here. And at the end of the day, not aligning those values could end up uh, at best in just low, pro low performance, but at, be uh, at worst crashes of your, of your system. You can use the downward API in Kubernetes and other tools to make this more automated so you don't have to um, do it manually. There's different ways of doing it. Downward API is something that I typically use. Some advanced tuning for the kubelet, you can tune or you should you tune at least the eviction thresholds, hard soft eviction thresholds. Swap typically is enforced to be not enabled in your in your on your node because the kubelet has it just has a hard time in identifying what swap is or giving you resource guarantees because swap is a disk resource and not a memory resource. That's why swap is enforced to be off on the node. And also apply cube reserved and cube uh, or system reserved. That's just reducing the amount of allocatable resources on the node and making some buffer for system critical demons, like for example the kubelet and the container runtime and other not uh, pods or not pod workloads. For system or latency critical workloads, use the CPU manager, or uh, as uh, Louise covered yesterday in her talk um, during resource management, there's much more like NUMA optimization that you can apply to for latency critical workloads or telco networking. And uh, use the burstable quality of service class if you are more advanced uh, without CPU limits, because then you can make use of spare idle CPU resources on, on the host. And there's some interesting discussions going on with the Zalando guys on how to uh, even tune this. Uh, the behavior that we currently have. And lastly, before we close, the kernel is a shared resource. Make sure you understand that Windows is not Linux. There's differences. The link has all the kind of the way uh, the internals of how Windows implements resource management from a kubelet perspective. And um, yeah, those are just some lessons learned here. I want to leave some time for questions now, which may be one, one a minute. Thank you very much. Sorry for rushing through. Slides are online. Thank you.
I think we have a minute for questions. Yes, please. Yeah, go ahead. I repeat, just shout. Yeah, so the question was, this customer is running Kubernetes on VMware, over-provisioning over on the VMware side, now over-provisioning in, in Kubernetes. Is this a good thing or not? Yes and no. Please come see me afterwards. We have come some best practice in alignment. Just see me afterwards. There was another question there. Yes, please. Uh, well, Prometheus, for example, you could use this. Uh, oh, the, sorry, the question was some of the workloads that you run um, could be starved because you don't specify requests or just minimal requests uh, in different environments. How to, how to monitor this? Uh, I talked to Timo, maybe he's in the room, uh, who had the same issue. Um, you could use C group statistics. That turned out to be pretty interesting. You say no? Okay, come, come see me afterwards. Tim, if Timo is in the room, we figured it out. Yes, please. Okay, so the question was, since you run into this fixed default quota enforcement of 100 millisecond, which for burstable workloads could ne or did ne negatively affect your workload, is there something to mitigate this? So Monzo created like their own implementation, or they kind of tuned Kubernetes uh, in there, that they allow for changing of this value, that they reduced it. Right now, it's not like in core upstream, so you cannot change this. Um, and an alternative would be the CPU manager. Unfortunately, that's static, so it's kind of isolating your CPUs, so the other parts won't be able to, to use them. I think if Luis from Intel is in the room, their CPU manager implementation was... Ah, yeah. ah Salando guys, nice. You're right. Yeah, there was Wish recommended yesterday that totally di disabling quota. So even if you specify limits, the kubelet will just not translate that, and you will uh, end up not having limits applied on on the system. Now that could be that could work, but it could also mean that if you don't have enough resource requests underneath, that there's too much pressure on the node, and um, you end up not not having uh, good resources. So it's it's currently unsolved, and there's a lot of discussion going on. Um, there's in, in this presentation, there was the link to the Zalando and the discussion with Vish and the other guys. Just jump in, make your thoughts and comments, please. Thank you. So just see me afterwards if, if there's more questions, please. Thank you. <laughs>